Have you ever looked at a weather chart and thought, what on earth do those squiggly lines and symbols actually mean? Well, in this video, I'm not just going to explain what they represent, I'll also dive into some of the theory behind it all. So buckle up, because we're about to take a whirlwind tour through the world of synoptic charts and unlock the mysteries they contain about the forces shaping our weather. Let's get started. These weather charts, or synoptic charts, are a meteorological roadmap that reveal the complex patterns behind the weather we experience every day. You've probably seen them on our forecast videos, and whether you're curious about understanding a storm's path, predicting sunny skies, or just fascinated by how meteorologists make their forecasts, these charts hold the answers. Sir Francis Galton is credited with producing the first modern weather charts in 1875. He also pioneered the use of weather charts in newspapers, with the Times first publishing them using data from the Met Office. The data used to plot the lines on synoptic charts comes from a wide variety of sources that are used to continuously monitor and predict atmospheric conditions. These include ground-based weather stations, where we measure the temperature, humidity, wind speed and air pressure at different locations, weather balloons, which carry instruments called radiosondes. These measure things like pressure and humidity and wind speed, but at, at different heights as they go up through the sky. Boys and ships, which monitor oceanic weather conditions, wind speed and water temperature, along with wave height. These days we also have satellites orbiting the Earth, these provide the bigger picture, showing us cloud cover and the big weather systems from space. Radars, which detect rain and snow, but also storm intensity and wind patterns, which is especially helpful for tracking thunderstorms and severe weather. Commercial aircraft and specialised weather planes also gather data on atmospheric conditions during flights. All of this information is collected to create detailed maps of what the weather is doing right now. It's also then fed into our complex meteorological computer models to predict the future state of the atmosphere. Here at the Met Office, we issue analysis charts. These show the observed state of the weather right now, along with forecast charts for up to five days ahead. Let's take a look at one of these charts. And we'll start with the basics, the, the wavy black lines. These, as you may know, are known as isobars. The term isobar comes from the Greek isos, meaning equal, and baros, meaning weight. And so these lines join up points of equal sea level pressure. So the pressure here is the same as the pressure here, and the pressure here is the same as the pressure here. Atmospheric pressure is the force exerted on a surface by the air in the Earth's atmosphere as it is pulled down by gravity. So essentially it's the weight of the air above us. Atmospheric pressure is typically measured in hectopascals, millibars, or if you have a barometer at home, maybe even in inches of mercury. On a synoptic chart, you will also see numbers on the isobars, and they indicate the pressure along that line. These values can help identify areas of high and low pressure. The centers of the high and the low pressure, well, they're marked with an X and have an associated pressure value. Now here is where you can start to get that three-dimensional sense of what is happening with the weather from these charts as areas of high pressure are caused by descending air and areas of low pressure are caused by rising air. The descending air in regions of high pressure, which are also known as anticyclones, reduces the formation of clouds and leads to calm weather conditions. Now in summer, this usually brings spells of warm weather with sunny skies, while in winter we can get cold and crisp days. However, low cloud can sometimes get trapped in these slow-moving weather systems leading to grey and gloomy skies. High pressure keeping the lid on the weather, if you like, keeping the cloud stuck under it, and that can lead to many days of fairly gloomy weather. Now, as I said, these pressure systems, these high pressure weather systems, are often quite slow moving, so that the weather they bring can last for many days or even weeks, and it can act as a, a blocker 
to the usual west to east flow, forcing faster moving low pressure systems to move around them. On the other hand, in areas of low pressure, also known as depressions, the air rises, cools, and all that water vapor condenses, forming clouds and rain. These low pressure systems tend to move faster, which is、um, a relief since they can sometimes bring stormy weather. The air doesn't just go up and down, but it also moves sideways. And if the Earth was still and didn't rotate, the air would simply want to flow from high pressure to low pressure. After all, Mother Nature likes things in balance. If you think of these isobars as lines on a contour map, so Areas of high pressure representing the peaks or the hills, and areas of low pressure representing the valleys. The difference between the high and low pressure values is known as the pressure gradient, and air will want to flow down that gradient, known as the pressure gradient force. Just like lines on a contour map, the closer the isobars are together. The steeper the pressure gradient, and the faster the air will move. So when you look at a synoptic chart, you'll be able to spot the regions where strong winds are by looking for areas where the isobars are tighter together. But air simply doesn't flow directly from high pressure to low pressure. We know that the Earth does rotate. And so this introduces an apparent force known as the Coriolis force. And as the air starts to move from high pressure to low pressure, the Coriolis force deflects the direction of the wind to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. All this means that in the northern hemisphere, air circulates around high pressure systems in a clockwise direction. And around low pressure systems in an anti-clockwise direction. This is the opposite in the southern hemisphere. Bayes' Balot's law is a handy little rule for figuring out where high and low pressures are just by paying attention to the wind direction. Here's how it works: If you're in the northern hemisphere and stand with your back to the wind, low pressure will always be on your left-hand side, and high pressure will always be to the right. Again, the opposite is true in the southern hemisphere. By knowing the flow directions around high and low pressure systems, you've got the key to cracking the general wind direction on a weather chart, and this is very handy because knowing where the air is coming from gives you a lot of information about its properties and what type of weather it's likely to bring. Because this concept is so important, when we talk about westerly winds, we mean that the air is coming from the west. And if we look to the west of the United Kingdom, we have the Atlantic Ocean. When air moves across that, it's going to pick up a lot of moisture from the sea surface. So when we have westerly winds, we generally get damp or, or wet weather. On the other hand, to the east of the UK. We have the European continent. Now, this is a vast landmass. So, when we have easterly winds, our weather is a lot drier. We can also have a good stab at relative temperatures and whether we might experience cold or warmer weather. Generally, air coming from the north or northerly winds is going to bring the UK colder weather because it's coming from polar regions. Whereas air moving up from the south or southerly winds, well, that's coming from tropical regions, and so will bring higher temperatures. There are aspects that can complicate things, such as the time of year, and you can find out much more about this concept in a video on air masses. Again, we'll put the link in the description. As we have just seen, these simple black lines on the charts, these isobars, are not so simple as they first appear. They can give us a whole host of information about the weather, such as wind direction, approximate speeds. And even a sense of temperature. Just a quick note to say that if you are enjoying this video, please do hit the subscribe button. As well as these explainers, we have weather content going out daily. Other features that mark out temperature boundaries on the chart are these coloured lines, yes, known as weather fronts. Frontal zones on weather charts started in Norway during the 1910s with Jakob Björkniss's theory 
deduced from World War I observations. He proposed that areas of low pressure have two convergence lines. One ahead, known as the warm front, which is drawn as a red line on uh, the coloured charts with semicircles, and one trailing behind, the cold front, which is drawn as blue lines with blue triangles on. The term front was used to describe its resemblance to military fronts during World War I. Now this may conjure up images of lots of action happening along these lines, and this is indeed the case, as we will typically see increased amounts of cloud and rainfall along weather fronts. Fronts are drawn along temperature boundaries, where the larger the temperature difference, the stronger the front, which generally means it has heavier precipitation. The direction in which these semicircles and triangles point, well, they simply dictate uh, the direction of travel of the front. If warm air advances and replaces colder air, it's known as a warm front. Conversely, if cold air is replacing warm air, well, that's a cold front. Cold fronts tend to bring the most dramatic changes in weather. As the cold air advances, it forces the warm, moist air to rise rapidly, often leading to the development of heavy rainfall, gusty winds, and even thunderstorms and tornadoes. So, it is the air behind the front and the direction in which it is moving that determines what type of front it is. This area between the warm front and the cold front is known as the warm sector. It is warm and moist air, and in this area, as a result, we tend to see a lot of low-level clouds, and it can bring mist and fog and also outbreaks of light rain and drizzle from time to time. As cold air is more dense than warm air, the cold air behind the cold front uh, gives the front an extra push. This means that a cold front will be moving faster than a warm front. The cold front can then catch up with the warm front and undercut it, lifting the warm air off the surface. So the temperature difference across the front is now less, and the precipitation along the front is generally weaker. This is the occluding process, and an occlusion is marked on the chart as a purple line with a semicircle and a triangle. Where the occluded front meets the warm and cold fronts, this is known as the triple point. Now, usually these fronts are drawn as a solid line, but sometimes you might see these lines broken up with a, with a dot or a cross. This brings in another three-dimensional element to the charts that I like to think of these dots and crosses as the uh, tip and fletches of an arrow. Where you see the dot, it is the tip of the arrow coming towards you, and air is rising out of the chart, where we have rising air, clouds and precipitation form. So fronts with these dots on are forming and getting stronger. This is known as frontogenesis. Where you see the crosses, it's the fletches of an arrow moving away from you. So it's descending into the chart, and descending air disperses clouds, so the front is weakening, and this is known as frontolysis. Now, the fronts with solid-filled semicircles and triangles are surface fronts, but you may also see these symbols, where they're not filled in. These are upper fronts and indicate temperature boundaries at higher altitudes, away from the surface. You may see fronts where it shows alternately warm front semicircles pointing in one direction and cold front blue triangles pointing in the opposite direction. This is a quasi-stationary front. You often see these fronts running parallel to the isobars. And as the wind is therefore aligned along the front and not across it, the front has kind of stalled and neither side is winning along the temperature boundary. These types of fronts can stay in place for days, bringing prolonged rainfall, but generally tend to weaken and break up before long. The last thing to mention about features on these charts are the darker black lines that um, have no semicircles, like this one down here or this one in the Mediterranean. 
These are called troughs and mark areas where the air is particularly unstable. This means that the air is quite turbulent and we tend to see concentrated areas of showers associated with these type of features. Troughs generally don't mark any sort of temperature boundary in the same way that weather fronts do. However, in some cases, they can be placed on thermal boundaries and are often a, a precursor to frontal development. Now, I did say that the trough was the last feature to talk about on a synoptic chart, but there are a couple of rare elements I thought I should also mention just in case they crop up. One of those is a convergence line, and these are drawn a bit like a branch on a tree on the chart. When winds blow from different directions and collide, this forces the air up. And if there's enough moisture, clouds can form and produce rain. Now, you might see these on charts in the summer months because of sea breeze formation. But convergence lines can happen at any time of year. In northerly wind flows, there's a common convergence line through the Irish Sea. And we uh, affectionately know this as the Pembrokeshire Dangler. There it is there. It can bring prolonged showers across both Pembrokeshire and Cornwall. If you look at our forecast charts, there is an additional feature that is these red dashed lines, red on the coloured versions at least. There's one there, dotted down just to the south of the United Kingdom. These are atmospheric thickness lines and they show the depth between two pressure levels and the numbers are shown in decameters. This one, 528 there. Now, I won't go into too much detail about this, but generally the lower the numbers show where the air is colder and the higher numbers show where the air is warmer. With warmer air, as it's less dense, you get a greater depth of atmosphere to exert the same pressure, whereas with colder, more dense air, you don't need quite as much. One line to highlight, though, is that 528 decameter line. That is quite useful for meteorologists as it's often referred to as the snow line. Areas north of that line tend to have air cold enough for the potential, at least, of snowfall. So that's definitely one to watch out for. The final thing, and I promise this time, you might see in late summer and early autumn are tropical cyclones. We mark them on the charts when we receive an advisory from the National Hurricane Center in Miami, Florida, and they come onto our chart area. So there's one there, Ernesto. A filled center, so when it's black like that one, means that the storm is still a hurricane, uh, which means the sustained winds of 74 miles an hour or more. Now, when these hurricanes start to weaken as they move out over colder waters, they initially get downgraded to tropical storm status. And that would then be marked like this with, with a circle that's not filled in. Now, these systems can track towards the UK, but by the time the storm is close to us, it's undergone changes, so that it's no longer a hurricane. So, I hope that gives you an idea of one of the most fundamental tools that us forecasters create and use here at the Met Office. As you can hopefully now see, there is a wealth of information contained within these charts. If you want more information about forecasting and indeed the processes involved, then do visit the Met Office website. Thanks so much for watching this video. We really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please do hit subscribe. And uh, while you're here, now that you've understood a little bit more about synoptic charts and you know about weather fronts, you might want to find out a bit more about air masses. So check this video out.